Hey guys, out here again with Josh. Got some uh, turtles and tortoises here. Yeah, so we're in South Carolina. Since I'm in South Carolina, most of the species I choose to work with are gonna be cold tolerant species that I could keep outdoors all year. This right here is a, a Florida Gulf Coast box turtle. So it's a semi-aquatic uh, turtle. Um, and there's actually a few in here. Um, the way I build these pens, I have some smaller pens and some larger ones. These pens are six by three. Um, that's when I have small groups that I wanna separate. And we also have some larger pens that are eight by four. But these Florida Gulf Coast, like most box turtles, they're omnivores. We feed them Missouri tortoise diet, which is basically a zoo diet. We'll mix in different greens and we throw it in there. But, but the thing is with box turtles in general, um, they like a lot of different options. So you can give them animal protein, insects, grubs. Uh, we give them lots of worms. So these guys, we don't exclusively give just Missouri diet. Um, so we basically give them Missouri diet to always have on hand and we throw tons of different grubs in there because they'll dig at the grubs all day. Um, they're very cold tolerant. This is a full grown animal right here. Um, they produce very well. And honestly, they're just good pets. I really enjoy them quite a bit. Um, now they're not out too much because it's a cool day here in the fall in South Carolina. What we do here, we throw a bunch of hay towards the rear. And then soon what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our heated, because we have heated hides for them and we place the heated hides in. We're probably gonna do that uh, probably sometime next month, but these guys are very, very cold hardy species. Um, like I said, they naturally occur on the, the Gulf Coast, um, which is naturally not too far from here. It's, it's a drivable distance, maybe like six hours, maybe a little less actually driving. So I have some three toads in here, but to, to get them out of here is gonna be pretty tough. So yeah, the smaller groups we keep in these six by threes, we put some water in there, we change it every other day, and we give them a varied diet tons and tons of personality. I'm a really big fan of uh, turtles and tortoises, especially smaller ones that are easy to house for me in my climate. Um, so, which is basically gonna be most of the box turtles and uh, testudos, which are the Mediterranean um, tortoises. And that's what we have in most of the other pens, but, but not all. But this right here is, uh, is not that. This is, a, this is a Gulf Coast box turtle. We also have uh, three toads as well. And we have an Eastern. So I can show you the Eastern over here. So this is a captive bred Eastern. I don't really breed the Eastern box turtles. Um, they're native to my state. So uh, I think in this state, you're allowed to have a few as pets, but I just took him out of his hay. He's, he's boxing up, he's closing more and more. He doesn't want us to see him. Um, but I know Dan took a video of him and put it on his Instagram story, if you guys follow that. And he has a really red head. And a lot of times the males only get the super red heads uh, to that extent when it's breeding season, but he pretty much has a really cherry red head all year. And of course, he's gonna be hiding that red head we're talking about, but he has a nice golden appearance. Um, I have many Eastern box turtles on the farm here, uh, but none of them look quite like him. This is a line bred animal uh, that they were bred in captivity for quite some time. But I just have one male in this uh, six by three pen, and he's pretty much just my pet. Um, I give him the similar diet to the, uh, the Gulf Coast box turtles and um, to my three-toed box turtles, which we do breed the other types. I just don't breed Easterns because um, there's really no need. They're native to the state and there's, there's plenty of them. So. so you guys could take a look at that one for a bit. And then I'm gonna grab some others for us to look at. Yeah, maybe he'll come out. <laughs> yeah, maybe. He'll think you're not looking at him. Yeah. Easy out. I do have some nice pictures of him, so maybe I'll make that picture the video picture so people can see him. what we have here. All right, so this is uh, an, an Eastern um, Eastern Herman's tortoise. Um, so this, this is actually an adult male. And so being a testudo, most, not all, but m many testudos are from the Mediterranean area. Um, you have some that are outside, like Russian tortoises, I believe, are are still on their testudo and obviously those come from uh, the southeastern portion of uh, Russia 
and they come from Afghanistan, Pakistan, places like that. But anyway, this particular guy, so you're gonna find this in uh, like the areas like Greece, uh, Spain, basically along the Mediterranean, and they, they vary quite a bit. This is a, a big male. And you could tell actually, because if you see this, you see how his opening right here, it's quite wide, right? And then also his tail is like thick and long. So this allows him to maneuver it easily, right? So when he's trying to breed, so if he's trying to breed, he has good maneuverability to mate with the females. The females have more of a, a shorter region right here and it's kind of egg shaped, you could say. Um, a lot of people say concavity of the, of the plasteron is a good way to tell, but certain species that doesn't work because you'll have some concavity, so you'll have them indented in, even in some females, and you'll have some males that aren't that concave. I mean, that's a, a decent indicator of sex, depending on the species, certain species, um, but I usually look at tail length and size, and uh, you really can't sex these guys as babies, at least I can't, and I think that's true for most people. Um, but you can, um, they're temperature sex dependent for, um, for incubation. So you could actually incubate them at certain temperatures if you want males or females. And what you guys are hearing in the background, there are the, uh, the tegus. We have some young tegus that are getting really active because it's uh, the hot time of the day. So the way I have these pens here, these are six by three pens. These are for my smaller groups. Like if I'm isolating something, like for example, I touched the Russians last in here because those are newly acquired. If I'm isolating an animal or I have small groups or an animal that doesn't get along with something else, I place it in these smaller six by threes. And then once they're um, doing well for us or they're in larger groups, they go in larger enclosures. Uh, we keep two metal panels so they have plenty of shade because uh, a lot of these species, believe it or not, could overheat pretty easily. So it's six feet and they're three feet and they have a two and two foot panel on each side so they could come to the center to sun themselves easily and then if they want to get shade they could go to either side one side has tons of straw so that they could be nice and insulated and one side is just shaded and also I, I intentionally put this aluminum with this reflective background on it um, because the birds of prey it kind of deters them a little bit um, and also these are these are big uh, tortoises so it'll be pretty challenging for a bird to get them. But in addition to having the shaded areas, um, they also have that reflective area there too. So that makes it less likely that they'll get um, attacked by something. I was trying to look for another one, but they hide really well. So I don't know if that'll be possible. So what you guys are looking at that, hopefully it comes out. Yeah, we'll take a look at the- starting, but then he sees me move and he goes back in. You can focus on that for a bit. And I'm gonna... Grab some food to feed these Russians. Russians are always hungry. Let's see if we set it here for a second if he eventually moves. turn is when he's going to make his move. So here, this is a new group of uh, Russian tortoises. Usually for a group this size of seven animals, we wouldn't keep it in a six by three, but this also serves as a quarantine type area. Uh, so basically we've had these guys for three months. Uh, they were long-term captives that I received. And then we quarantined them for six months and uh, we send in tests uh, on the stool samples and you know the whole quarantine procedure basically. But anyways, and then once they pass that, which so far they're passing with flying colors, uh, they're going to get migrated to our larger pens and it's important to always touch anything you're quarantining last so that's what we do here we touch these guys last um, and russian tortoises 
they're ranged and you'll see like some scarring on them. This is scarring that was there previously. Um, I'm not sure honestly how they got that, but, but they did have it at some point. Um, okay, so a large portion of their range is actually outside of Russia. Um, so you Afghanistan, Pakistan, you know, Central Asia type area. Um, so a large portion of the range is outside of Russia, although they do occur in Russia as well in certain portions of it. And um, so these guys here, they also call them um, like Afghan tortoises. There's a lot of different names uh, for Russian tortoises. Um, so technically, I believe they're still considered a testudo, so they would be in the, um, the same group with the other Mediterranean uh, tortoises. So when you talk about... Um, tortoises like your your Herman's tortoise and uh, tortoises like that so the Greek tortoises so and these guys are always pretty food crazy so, up here. and they'll eat even when it's cold they, they're very very cold tolerant because where they naturally occur and this this is the ritual you have to step on your food get it all over the place and then you eat it Apparently that's the way, that's the way they do it. So I'm gonna get a second tray. That's usually what I do. I put two trays out. Um, so I give them primarily the Missouri tortoise diet. Um, with a lot of tortoises, uh, particularly this type as well, you wanna make sure you don't give them too much protein. Uh, you give them too much protein, if it's not naturally part of their diet, that could work out uh, not so well for you. And then if you have other tortoises, like grassland species, like Socatas, for example, you really want to avoid um, heavy protein, because heavy protein is one of the things that could lead to pyramiding. Um, let me get their second tray before they go nuts. Usually they get two trays. They're kind of food maniacs. They really have two trays. All the tortoises I have here, a lot of turtles and tortoises I have here, are cold tolerant species, but the only ones that are eating today, since it's a cool morning, are these guys here. And eventually they'll stop eating as well, and we actually stop offering food at some point closer to brumation. But um, this time of the year in South Carolina, you could have a day that's 70 degrees during the day, you could have a day that's you know 90 degrees during the day. So September in South Carolina is a is a really odd month. It's usually warm most of the month, but we have random cool days. So some of these guys, put them here. But yeah, that's some of our turtles and tortoises, at least in our smaller pens. And uh, so we do you know, quite a variety of, of different species here. Um, and I, I particularly enjoy the the turtles and, and and tortoises. And for Russian tortoises especially, uh, since they're harvested so much from uh, wild populations, I think it's important that we um, that we breed them in captivity. So that's what we're trying to do here, and we're happy to work with them. All right, we'll stop this so we can get the last video done. See you guys.